My last question. Can you sing anything from a Marvel movie? I'm like the biggest Marvel fan that I know of. I just, I can't think of any of the songs. Um, Number one verse. <laughs> I no. no. Oh, I wow. should know this, but I don't. Shit. <laughs> Let's go, 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 go! Welcome to Cord Killers, our mission to report the intel from the front lines of the cord cutting revolution so you can watch the stuff you love when you want, where you want, on whatever device you want. We'll help you sift through the madness. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, man, I'm Ryan Brushwood, and more importantly, can you name any Marvel music that you know of? Uh, Spider-Man, Spider-Man. <laughs> that, uh, that was the point of the video. That came from uh, the YouTube channel uh, Every Frame a Picture. Is that what it is? Every uh, Frame a Painting. Every Frame a Painting. Um, asking the question, and he makes the argument, and I think it's a pretty solid argument, not that they do bad scoring, it's just that they do safe scoring, and he goes into the whole practice of temp scoring, where you grab something that already exists, you throw it in there, and you say, we're going to make our own music later, but then he says the problem is that the editors edit to the temp score that they have, for example, the Inception soundtrack or whatever, and then by the time they hand the finished product to somebody who has to score it, the people who have to score it have to score, they've edited to the beats of existing music, so they have to match those beats, and and then they're embarrassed of it, so they want to hide it behind a bunch of, you know, uh, dialogue or whatever. It's fascinating, fascinating stuff. I think he's actually right on the money. How are you doing, Tom? I am doing well, and I'm very excited that Dan Benjamin from 5x5 Five Five is joining us, who can sing all the Marvel theme songs, right? All, all of them. All yeah. Spider-Mans. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. We've been trying to put this together for about Ever? a million years. I'm so glad you're, you, uh, you finally were able to... Work with me enough to get me on. on I'll tell you what. Yeah, with the, the grids crossed. I'm yeah. glad it worked out. There was a brief shining moment that I thought you were going to make it down in studio, but then you remembered that I live on the other side of the planet, uh, the planet being Austin, Texas from you. That's right. That's right. No, I wanted to, you, uh, and I've, I've wanted to see your studio forever, and I thought, well, you know, like, it's it's only an hour maybe or so down there, and then I'm like, wait a minute, they record it at 6 p.m. Well, that's the problem, time. right, is that we record at rush hour, yeah. so there's no making it down here. Like, I'll show up at noon and just sit out in your driveway and wait until you can bring yeah. me in the house. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, thanks for being on. Uh, great to have you. we got a lot of interesting stuff to talk about, so let's get right into our primary target. Yep. So the FCC is up to a lot in the cord cutter space this week. We'll talk about the cable box update in a second. But Netflix has filed a request with the FCC to add data caps to its congressionally mandated annual review of telecommunications deployment. Uh, according to the Telecommunications Act, the FCC is required by law to look at the deployment of telecommunications access in the country and give a report on how good it is. Now, usually those reports focus on availability, like who is able to get what, and with internet, particularly what speeds. Uh, so you've heard a lot about the FCC setting the definition of broadband, et cetera. The Netflix filing says we would like the commission to investigate data caps and, and use data caps in their report. Uh, particularly, Netflix says the commission should hold that data caps on fixed line networks and low data caps on mobile networks may unreasonably limit internet television viewing and are inconsistent with Section 706. And that's the Telecommunications Act that says everyone should be able to access stuff. So, Brian, basically Netflix arguing the FCC should point out if data caps are keeping people from watching the video they want, where they want, when they want. So I uh, remember that Rick and Morty where indecision caused two realities to split out and there's two different realities and Schrodinger's cats everywhere. Uh, there's one Brian that says, that's great, Tom. Finally, a big institution with a moneyed interest in making sure that data caps go away is making noise and pushing big old bad government to investigate data caps. I hate data caps. You hate data caps. We all hate data caps. Maybe they'll go away thanks to this. In the other reality, <laughs> the other Brian says, so let me get this straight. This is a plea from a private institution to a government entity to make an evaluation of a not that may affect a non-binding list of suggestions that they may make in the future. 
Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Okay. <laughs> that, both both Brian's exist, by the way. In both Brian's are right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, this has more effect than maybe it seems, but it's not legally binding. It wouldn't force companies to drop their data caps, no. Yeah, but it, it does matter in the, you know, uh, there is a great um, podcast, um, I want to say Freakonomics, maybe, talking about how little power the president actually has. However, you know, all of his power is in the bully pulpit in his ability to indicate, you know, hey, they voted for me. This is what America wants. I'm here. I'm putting pressure on it. I think that's what's happening with Netflix is they're saying, hey, America loves us. We're the best, second only to porn and YouTube. Uh, uh, this is what America wants is no data caps. And I couldn't agree more. What about you, Dan? Why are you in favor of data caps? No, please. Uh, <laughs> you know, what's, what's interesting, though, is, you know, that Netflix is, is someone has to someone has to kind of take this argument. Someone has to take this stance. And it makes sense that it's Netflix just for the reasons that 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 we all know that Netflix is is a, the biggest player probably in the space. And they're the ones that are the most affected by it. There are plenty of people who are going to run into a data cap. I remember one time I went on a on a vacation and they had said, oh, we've got we've got Internet there. We've got Wi-Fi. When I got there, it, of course, didn't work. And uh, nothing we could do could make it work. But I said, OK, well, I've got a, a data plan and I'll just use that. And I upgraded the data plan as much as I could. But, you know, still, like I, I knew that, well, we can watch one show a night, but not two. And that's very frustrating. And there's a lot of people who that's that's their regular situation. They don't have a beautiful fiber connection. They you know, who knows what they have, but they can't consume the data that they want. So then. Uh, you know, now, now Netflix is coming out and saying, this is, this is serious. This is real. And this is something that, uh, we're, we're going to, uh, we're going to try and push forward. I don't know, but it has to change. Well, it's particularly a problem for mobile, right? That yeah. more data caps are being put on landlines as Comcast particularly says, oh, we're going to enforce our data cap thing. Now we're testing it in more markets, but their data caps are a terabyte. I mean, Comcast, all with the, their whole history of data caps have always tried to set it where it wouldn't trigger for most people. And a terabyte's right. probably enough for most people, 90% of their customers. Mobile, however, everything has a data cap and every data cap is very small and very expensive. And like you say, like maybe you could watch two shows these days on modern data caps a night, but you're gonna be very picky about what you use up that data cap with if you're watching on mobile. So here's the funny thing about mobile data caps is uh, I gave up. I had the unlimited forever AT&T, you know, grandfathered in unlimited nice. plan. But once I heard about the throttling after, what, two gigabytes, one gigabyte, I forget what it was, uh, I, I got annoyed by it. And you couldn't tether. There's another number of restrictions. And so I, I went to the 15 gigabyte shared family plan. Uh, and it was great. It, it is great. You know, everything's super fast. You 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 get uh, uh, broadband speeds. You could tether. Uh, and then just in the last two months, all of a sudden, I kept going over the 15 gigabytes. I was like, what's going on? And I looked, and my data was the same. And then I realized that I'm an eight-year-old who's becoming increasingly savvy with her phone. And all of a sudden, there's three extra gigabytes uh, popping up in there. So uh, as much as I loved and have said in the past that data caps are going away. They're not. They're not away yet. Yeah. <laughs> and do you guys know? Do you guys have here. any idea how much data you're uh, you're actually using, like at home to watch TV, Netflix, everything else that that you do? Have you? Have it's it's, it's about a gigabyte an hour, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, like just for Netflix, for uh, normal uh, 720 on most browsers, 1080 on some. I I think it's a gigabyte of data per hour. Yeah, well, and once you start to have to think about it, you start to change your decisions about how much you're going to watch and what you're going to watch. And I think that's why Netflix is filing this, is if people are starting to think about things, they might start to think about whether they need to pay for Netflix. This right. Whereas is a, uh, what, if, if they don't have to think exactly about right, it, they'll Tom. just keep subscribing. Exactly. So so I, it occurred to me, and I think I had mentioned this all the way back in the frame rate days, even though there's no actual scarcity, that perceived scarcity has caused all of us to become the old men fussing over the uh, thermostat or leaving the lights on. It's like, uh, you know, Josie, you can't start Netflix and leave the room. That's bandwidth. You're using you're up all right. the bandwidth. No, you're totally right. Oh, man. My, my mom, who's in her 70s now, uh, doesn't have Wi-Fi in her apartment. Uh, so her phone is her only data. She uses like eight to 10 gigabytes a month. That's amazing. Yeah, but because no, she's an active phone user. It's, it's more amazing to me that she's able to get away with only her mobile device as her complete connection yeah. to the internet. And right. the thing is, if she didn't have this BS data cap, 
I, I wouldn't worry about it at all. I'd be like, yeah, mom, that's, that's great. And she could live entirely with that as her internet connection. So what, what these data caps do on mobile is it, it sort of prevents that as an option for cord cutters. Like you're not going to look at mobile as an internet connection and therefore it's one less competitor that you can use for your cord cutting setup. Real quick, uh, veering into DTNS ter territory here, yeah, yeah. I think we've talked about it before, but uh, there have been some cities that Google has said, not that we're gonna, but next time we do Google Fiber, what if we did it without the fiber and did everything wireless? Like, how far off, if you're just going to roll the dice and place a Las Vegas bet somewhere, how far off do you think we are from some kind of revolutionary just switch and all of a sudden we're drowning in soup? Yeah. That was like five um, metaphors, by the way. I apologize. <laughs> I think we'll all be drowning in soup by 2025. Okay. Uh, bandwidth, though, maybe 2020. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's 2020 before we see Google seriously roll out that, that directed wireless. But that's different than wireless coverage that the carriers have. By 2020, they'll have 5G, at which point they're going to have to up their bandwidth caps because you'll using 5G connection, you'll run through you know a five gigabyte cap in a couple of days. Sure. And that's what I'm, we see I'm usually when they get now, faster you know, speeds, have, they up the data I have account. two kids. We have a TV in two different rooms. Uh, one's watching something on Hulu. Another one's watching something on Netflix. And, you know, and then in the evenings, more of that Hulu, Netflix, HBO, you know, all of that essentially coming over our data connection, none, nothing coming over a cable connection. Uh, I don't think that it's 10 hours a day of TV, but, you know, when you've got two people in different rooms watching something... There's there's a lot. I I think one terabyte's not going to last if that's what they're pushing. I agree. You know, to try and get it to be that oh, that's yeah. the last what, thing. So, I, so I, 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 I think you bring up a really good point, Dan, in that you're talking about consumption in parallel, not in yeah. series. We're not all getting in the same room watching the same thing. And beyond that, you know, I just downloaded, uh, made a, a, a snap nine dollar purchase for a Vive download. And once the video right. goes 360, once we're looking at the amount of data that comes with 4K HDR, uh, terabytes going to be nothing. I mean, think about it. You got kids sitting in in one room watching, you know, or streaming or watching Twitch, you know, playing their games. You got another person in another room who's streaming their Spotify music. You've got the parents in the other room watching something. And by the way, one of the each parent has their own second screen and they're watching a YouTube video on it. I mean, think about that. That's you know, it's it's getting easier and faster to push that kind of content to people, but it's going to, you know, the, a terabyte, I feel like I've burned through that in halfway through the month. So I don't know. Not to mention 4K HDR shows that people right, are going right. to watch, which takes up more bandwidth. Uh, so, yeah, this is this is something that Netflix, it's, it's certainly in Netflix's self-interest, but they're pointing out, like, this is not a problem that's going to go away. You need to consider this. They're even saying they don't like zero rating. Like T-Mobile doesn't count Netflix against your data cap because it's part of their binge on program. And Netflix benefits from that, but they're still saying we don't like these zero rating programs because they, they generally just hurt the business uh, across the board. By the and way, not every carrier has one. That is a smart, smart, smart move for them to make because that is the third rail of the internet to do anything that indicates that you are cool with n anything other than total net neutrality, right? Yeah, so it's yeah, like, absolutely. instead they're like, we're like you, man, we hate it. Yeah, fight the power. We are the power. <laughs> I mean, we're also the power, but we're power on your side this time. Uh, this time. Yeah. Uh, my, and like I said, uh, side note here, FCC, uh, we've been talking about their cable set-top box uh, rules. And, and at first, they sounded really, really antiquated, like who cares about cable set-top boxes anymore? But the more they modify them, the more they talk about them, the more they sound like something that maybe could provide you more choices. Because the idea now is that the FCC will let cable companies write their own software, but have to create apps that can run on any machine that is has a large, uh, I think what they called it, a widespread base. Uh, so Roku's, Apple TV's, et cetera. The cable companies wanted it to be strictly HTML5. The FCC said, no, it, it has to be whatever is available out there. Uh, they have to provide DVR functions and a single license for the software. And that's the thing the cable companies are most upset about. They want to negotiate a different license from each other, each cable company so they can squeeze more money out of on demand. Uh, but essentially, it looks like the FCC is going to pass a rule saying the cable companies have to provide apps. Once they've spent the money to have to do that, you would think they'll want to monetize it by marketing those apps outside of areas where they provide traditional cable service. Now, they don't have to. That's not part of this. But it'll be interesting to see if they do. 
How far off do you think we are from independent of this discussion, but but peripherally evolving from it? How far uh, there was a wired uh, headline like four months ago that says in the future, we won't write apps, we'll train them. Right. Um, uh, I, I, we've talked about the idea of this digital concierge who understands what you like or whatever. I, I, I got to imagine that we're maybe a year or two away from w one of these neural networks from being able to just you just train it. You're like, yeah, this is the box. I don't want to know what anything works and, and do it. H how far off do you think we are? A couple of years. Oh, so I'm right. I, I mean, a couple I, of years from I wasn't it, prepared to be right. <laughs> a couple of years from it working reasonably well. Now, now your ideal of I don't have to think at all, I think is probably farther off. Sure, but, sure. But like having something where it's like reasonably good is is already getting close. I mean, when I open PlayStation View, it shows me the shows that I record or watch and puts the ones I do most frequently to the left. That's kind of dumb. And it still speeds things up immeasurably for me. Once it has a little bit of, of machine intelligence smarts in there, which is available, I think that's only a couple of years away from making it really good. Right on. Dan, I, just, you, I like the app idea. I mean, it makes more sense. You know, it. Uh, we, we need to get past the idea that, uh, that, that the hardware is important. We need to get back to the idea that content is important. And if, if I'm a content provider, you know, you, you you guys are content providers. You want your stuff to be available in as many places as you can. And the, and uh, the onus is on you to get it out there right now. But now I think they're kind of turning that around. I just cable. We all know how bad cable boxes are. We all know how bad the hardware was. If it, this kind of reminds me when uh, I don't know if there was legislation passed or if something just changed where you were finally allowed to have your own cable modem in your house. You didn't have to get the one that the cable company provided to you that was usually subpar. It was usually used. It was usually old technology. And uh, and and something happened where now you could go to Amazon or Best Buy or wherever you felt like and, and grab your own and plug it in and call them up and say, I have a new cable modem. And here's the uh, here's the idea on the back of it. It's it, this is what I'm using now. We should have that flexibility across the board. And you know, when you when you hear about uh, the things that you know maybe Apple wanted to do with the Apple TV originally, providing this kind of thing. I mean that that is the future, but it's the future that no cable provider wants. They want that control. You know, they want everything, and they don't they don't want any responsibility. But they want all of our uh, behavior data. They want to see what we're watching. They want to control the experience, and they yeah, do a they terrible job. They want to monetize channel placement and right. what gets suggested to you because they don't want machine learning to get good at telling you what you want. They want to be able to sell that placement. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Convince you. Yeah. Uh, well, we do not sell our placements. Uh, we instead have you guys support us. The reason Cord Killers exists, Brian Brushwood, is because of the patrons at patreon.com slash cord killers. Yeah, dude, if you missed it, it was a hell of a Cinderella story. Out, kicked out into the alley, the streets by ourselves. We said, hey, man, you want to do this show? You think people would like it? Turns out you do. 1,829 of you guys changed our lives two years ago plus. Are we coming up on three years? Is that really happening? Yes, it is. Wow. Uh, yeah, you guys changed our lives. It matters more to us than anything on the entire planet. And if you want to be part of the team, Cord Killers, head on over to patreon.com slash cord killers. We don't care how much you contribute. It could be a penny. It could be a dollar. It could be ten dollars. It could be a hundred thousand dollars. We'd probably care if you gave us a hundred thousand dollars. But the point we would is care. please we give us a hundred thousand dollars. That's fine. The point we is the point is we want to see you go from zero to anything. Join the team. Head on over to patreon.com slash cord killers. Keep us in business, man. Now we're gonna tell you how to watch all these things in signals intelligence. Heck yeah. Normally I wouldn't, but we got bosses to please. CBS All Access. Uh, you probably know it as the future home of the Good Wife spinoff. Or maybe Star Trek Discovery uh, in the United States. We'll offer a commercial free version of the service for an extra $4 a month. CBS All Access is currently 6 bucks a month. So for $10 a month, you can get all those same CBS shows without commercials. Also, they announced that they've got an app for the Xbox One. So you Xbox One fans can get CBS All Access without having to use another box. Uh, first big service after Hulu to offer a commercial free tier, Brian. Uh, first of all, let's just uh, quick around the horn. Is there any of us that thinks this isn't a great idea? I think it's a great idea. Dan? Totally great. Yeah. Great absolutely. idea, right? Tom, great idea? I could use it a little cheaper, but sure. Yeah. All right, Bryce, great idea? Yeah. Okay. I'd now let's get good. into the wild speculation. 
what reason, what possible justification do they have for not launching with this tier available? Oh, because they don't want to screw up uh, their advertiser relationships. So, right? so this is a way for them to They say, hey, we're doing a digital thing, but don't worry. It's only good for you guys, advertisers. Uh, you know, it just all we're doing is making available even more ad inventory. Won't right. it be great? I think it's partly that. Partly they wanted to sell some digital only ads and they wanted to have as big of an inventory number as possible. And if you had a commercial free tier, then that's fewer numbers at the beginning. Now that they've been launched and they have a number out there and they're selling into it, they can risk adding that tier, especially when they know that a lot of Star Trek Discovery fans would not go to subscribe to CBS All Access if it had commercials. They'd find some other way to get it. And I think you just nailed it. They always, always knew that this would be available. There would never be a point that they couldn't, they, they, they can't start with this tier and then eliminate it, but yeah. they can start without it and knowing they could always add it. Yeah, I think that's a key point too. And this, again, this is like not the first time that a, a place like CBS has done this kind of thing. I don't know, you know, when whenever there there seems to be so much resentment from people if they're paying for a service of any kind, uh, whether it's Hulu or whether it's, you know, whatever the service is where then they also see a commercial, they're like, wait a minute, I'm paying money and now I, I have to listen to an ad. There's a great deal of resentment there. And I, I think in some cases rightfully, but you know, this is, this is the, wh where we want to be is we want to be able to pay for the content that we enjoy and just that content. We don't want that to be interrupted by something like a commercial. And we feel angry and resentment if, uh, if, if there is anything like that. So it's, you know, to think that we are, are writing out a check every single month for something. And now we're, our eyes are being forced to endure something like a commercial. I mean, I, I think that people should, should re reject that. And I think advertisers, uh, just like they, just like they are on the web and just like they are in podcasts and just like they are everywhere else are starting to, uh, to, to feel the squeeze a little bit, you know, they're, they're starting to feel that pressure that there need to, there needs to be some other way for them to, to make their money other than these ads that people typically don't, don't want to watch or don't see. I mean, how many people do you know that say, oh, well, I know that this uh, such and such a series is on right now, but you know what? I'm not going to watch it while it's on TV. I'll get it through uh, through iTunes. That, or that's I'll, that's you know. me. That's yeah. I am I am that guy. Like like Mr. Robot, all of that stuff. I just want it pre-edited and, and and taken out. Right. I would pay the cost to, to to watch Mr. Robot on iTunes just so I don't have to endure commercials or fast forward through them. Yep. It's yep. worth yep. it just to do it that way. And 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 that's a double whammy because not Terrible only are you paying advertising. you're paying per episode, but you're also paying with time delay. You're not watching it real time with everyone else. It's a superior experience for me to wait an entire day, watch it the next day, and right. and and just get it as a forty three minute block than watch it real time. But Brian, how many people do you know personally who are still other than sporting events who are watching live TV a show when it comes out, with the occasional exception of a big premiere or a big finale? I mean, my parents. <laughs> Yeah. And that's it, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's the big premieres of the big finales, right? Those are the ones. Or or maybe if someone's so into a show like The Walking Dead uh, that they, they have to watch it in real time, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the, the majority of people don't want the commercials. Here's, here's one that I wonder how it would work. And I, my guess is that it's just a stillborn idea. But what if a what if a service uh, Turner's been making noise about? Hey, we're going to come out with a uh, a service that we're going to market directly to people across the world. What if they came out with an ad free version of Turner, and then said we'll also then later on introduced a cheaper version? In other words, they do it the opposite way, and the pitch is our service is worth ten dollars a month, but we'll only charge you six dollars a month if you let some ads play. Ooh. You know what? That's when I'm going to kick over to the viewers because I find it repugnant. And I, for some reason, it's that I feel like something's being taken away from me by the addition of ads on there. Um, but you're but, not getting rid of the commercial free tier. So it's just sure, like, sure, hey, sure. can't afford the $10. Here's a way to get it cheaper. I, I don't argue with the logic or that the uh, the per or, or that the the calculated value is identical. But but, you know, we all know that we're irrational beings. We feel different about being, you know, if I say, hey, uh, give me 50 cents and I'll give you this lollipop. 
then you feel good. But if I give you a lollipop and that's yours and I say, hey, give me 50 cents or I'm going to take that lollipop away, you feel very different about right. it, right? right? So, Dan, no, you agree I, that this I just, is just I something wanna people throw, would... I want to throw something out at you guys. Do you think that uh, that the networks actually like having commercials? Do you think they like having to sell that airtime? Or do you think they would rather, as you guys do... Uh, offer something great and have a direct relationship with the consumers. That's my theory. Is it, but I don't know how they make that transition, right? I think I think they like big numbers of commas. They like stability. Yeah. They like yeah. telling shareholders that this is how it's been for the last ten years. There's no reason not to think it won't continue to be this right. way. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think you're what? probably right, and that's the scary part, and that's why you see so much. Uh, rallying against it. You know, the, the, the great content that I find on TV, and there's a lot of great content, the, the large majority of the shows that I find myself watching uh, these days are, I mean, you guys have talked about Stranger Things. You've talked about, uh, I love House of Cards. I mean, so many of the shows that, that are really memorable for me in a post-lost world uh, have not come from traditional networks. They've come from a relationship where Netflix or a network like that is, uh, or or you guys or people who I, you know, the, the shows that I listen to, most of the entertainment that I consume, I'm time shifting it and I have a direct relationship with the producers of that particular content where I'm paying them money in as direct a way as possible to enjoy that show. And more and more, even the shows like Brian was just saying, even the shows that are coming out from the network, uh, we are choosing to get directly from the network and circumventing those advertisers completely. So again, an example there uh, is, uh, you know, it may be, maybe the perfect example there is Mr. Robot, which I see it on iTunes. I've never seen it with a commercial I've never watched it live. I've always only ever watched it on iTunes. So that's as direct of a relationship as I can have with the folks making Mr. Robot. You know, I'm not, I'm not watching it on TV. Uh, the same is true even for shows that I've discovered, like The Good Wife, which I'm, I'm in season two of now. I'm watching that on Hulu. I'm not seeing it with commercials because I pay for the You know what I'm saying? So we as consumers are doing every single thing that we can to e eliminate the advertisers. And companies like Netflix that are really embracing this, that are really saying, you know what, Th this is the way to do it. Uh, let's go and, and get that. Let's make more content and make the best content that it then becomes a no-brainer. And, and I agree with you that they want to see these lots of, lots of commas. It's a wonderful way to say it. But, but they're going to wind up you know, writing their own uh, obituaries if they don't start adapting and, and do the kinds of things that CBS is, is trying to do with all access. Yeah, so. and that's as, as annoyed as we are with uh, the new Star Trek being behind a paywall and so on. Yeah. It's, it's very forward thinking and it's a bitter pill for them to swallow, but it's a smart move for them to make as much as, as I'm yeah. annoyed by it. And, yeah. and taking giving you a commercial free tier starts to take it closer to the idea of, well, yes, but also the new Arrested Development was behind a paywall and Stranger Things is behind a paywall. And and so it's just a different service. It's the funny. And even is, the term, is it's, there it's enough a, on CBS to make you want to pay it's, $10? It's that taking the lollipop away thing because Netflix right. says, hey, we have a lollipop. It's 10 cents, you know, but CBS says, hey, give us 10 cents because uh, we're taking back the lollipop otherwise. And like but, that just you know, felt, feels different to us. It does. It feels really different. Even calling it a paywall feels different because to me the, the whole concept of a paywall is I used to read this website for free and now they've built a wall and I have to pay to get through the wall whereas I don't feel that way about Netflix at all I, I think that's the best 15 20 bucks a month that I spend if they if Netflix said you know what, now it's five more bucks a month I wouldn't care like still it's well worth it you know the amount yep. of entertainment that my kids and that I get from this it's fine I don't even think of it as as a paywall I think of it as like you know, it's almost like air conditioning or running water in a yeah. way, you know, like you, you've got to have it. And if it's gone, you really, really miss it. But I don't think of like, it's outrageous that I have to pay for the electricity that I'm using in my house. It's not outrageous. I'm, I, I'm using electricity. You that, was, know? So, that was one of the arguments against air conditioning is like, why don't you want air conditioning? And like, it makes it too hot outside. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> because when you didn't have it, you didn't realize how freaking hot oh, it was. That's yeah. right. All right, uh, more on how to watch in our Gear Up segment about the gear you use. 
So today, TiVo announced an update to the Bolt. It'll be called the Bolt Plus. Uh, it'll cost $200 more than the original boat, $499. Uh, it can record two more channels at a time, so it can record six channels at once. Three terabyte hard drive instead of one terabyte hard drive. Comes in glossy black instead of white. Uh, it is 4K, as is the original Bolt. Uh, no HDR yet, although they did say that a software upgrade could add HDR at some point down the line. It goes on sale Thursday, September 15th. This is the first product to come out since the completed takeover of TiVo by Rovi. Rovi and TiVo have now merged, and the new company is still called TiVo, not Rovi. Uh, there's also a new TiVo interface that has been posted online, uh, centered around surfacing what you want to watch rather than just showing you everything that's on. And there's an FCC filing out there from TiVo describing a networked over-the-air DVR similar to Tableau or Simple TV that would allow you to watch your DVR programs on other devices like Roku's and Apple TV's, uh, possibly, rather than having to have a TiVo box in every room. I, I want to, because we were talking about it a little earlier, I want to focus on this idea of centering around surfacing what you want to watch. This new TiVo interface is taking another step down that road of saying, we don't want you to look at a guide that has a grid of channels anymore. We know what you've got a season pass for recording. We know the kinds of things that you've been watching on Hulu and Netflix in the apps on TiVo. So we're going to put those things front and center in the interface. You know what? In a world where Pandora has gotten pretty good at understanding what you like based on, on what you've been listening to, uh, I, I, I could just see us getting farther and farther to where you just, I, I mean, TiVo as a brand could be the box that you plug in and it says, hey, what's your Facebook profile? And it says, give me a second. All right, that's who you know. This is what you watch. This is what you tweeted about. This is what you talked about. You're like, great. All right, we've got your guide set up. And then, you know, we, we know what you're going to like or, you know, and then, you know, we'll, we'll do experimental things every now and then throw up like a blast from the past or, hey, this just, you know, came onto the Netflix library and so on. Uh, I can't wait to be controlled by the robots. It's going to be great. <laughs> Dan, do you want to be controlled by the robots? Uh, you know, it's funny. I have such mixed feelings about this because I'm the same kind of person who's I couldn't be more anti a Nest thermostat. I want to set that thing just where I want that thing to be. And so I definitely am in a groove when I say that, you know, these are the sources of content that I want to pick on this particular device at this time. Don't show me stuff. Don't think that you know me. You don't you know don't me. Know me. Yeah, but, no, you totally know me. <laughs> Computer, but, <laughs> I'm not that complicated. No, that's the thing. Is it that <laughs> is that I'll, I'll I'll go on there and a Fire TV will say, you know, or like I'll even just within Hulu or within Netflix, I'll show some kind of recommendation. I'm like, ah, that you know, okay, that looks kind of interesting. Brian Brushwood, I'll see what you know he's up to, and then it'll be some show with Brian Brushwood, and I'm like, oh, I I did like that. You did know me. How did you do that? <laughs> I'll tell you the one feature I want from these as they get better and better. And, and, and it has to be good at knowing the things I like for this to be useful for me. I want a I'm feeling lucky button for television where I don't know what I want to watch. I just want to have something on. And maybe it can choose between TVs and movies, but otherwise I'm making no choice. Yep. And it's, it's the similar thing to channel surfing, but with even less choice and a better result, which is it says, oh, we know you like this sort of stuff. We're not going to show you any of the stuff we know you watch and record already, but here is a Godzilla movie marathon. You know, or here is, you know, Kill yeah. Bill or so, whatever. See, that would like, now get excited, Tom. So you yeah. got a random button. Wouldn't it be great if it was so random that it did the quote unquote risky thing? What if it just joined a movie near the end of the first act? Like you just uh -huh. hit the random button and all of a sudden something explode and James Bond said, that's why I'm awesome. And you're like, <laughs> what? I'm watching this, you know, and you just keep on watching from there. Yeah, take you back to the old HBO on the clicker channel days. Yeah. I mean, I, is that just a thing we like because of our age, though? Maybe, maybe. But uh, we've talked before. There's been studies that show that beginning with the ending of the show does not diminish people's enjoyment. You know, if if, if uh, because they, they had books that they took the last chapter and cut it out out of context and opened with it. So people began knowing that at some point we get to this kind of ending. I I think that might be a fine thing to randomize and put in the store. The key thing with that old HBO experience, too, is you knew you could start watching it from the beginning, like three hours later. Exactly. Right. You knew right. that you, yes, exactly. You know, oh, today's the day they're showing yeah. st Star Wars. So it'll be on in another two hours and another two hours. Yeah. Because uh, if you could replicate that part of it, too. I think that would be that that would be very interesting. All right, uh, that's how you watch. Let's talk about what to watch in under surveillance. Not like you, it's all about location, location, location. Under surveillance. 
Because, man, if you haven't realized it already, their number of choices is only growing. Uh, we've got more things to tell you about. Trailer Park, a uh, bunch of trailers coming out. Trailer out for a Nat Geo series called Mars. This is from the production house of Ron Howard and Brian Grazer. It's a six-part series. And what's interesting is it's weaving a scripted drama about the first Mars mission set in 2033 with a documentary uh, documentary style interviews about the reality of such a mission. So you'll have interviews with Elon Musk, real Elon Musk interviews, and then you'll go back to the scripted drama about the trip to Mars. Uh, premieres in 171 countries in November. Thanks to Christy Cates, by the way, for pointing this out. Quick question. Do you think, and maybe this is already known, but I didn't catch it when I watched the trailer, do you think that they encouraged everybody to speak in the past tense, causing everybody who have to act and it's like i i kind of i kind of wince a little when i say act and i use air quotes or do you think they t have them talk about what the first mars mission will be like because i hope it's the latter not the former i think it's i think it's got to be i think it's got to be the latter i mean uh, well they're all dead by 2033 is my in the, in this timeline 2033 yeah that's just well because there was a huge explosion uh, so oh, <laughs> I don't know the astronauts. Uh, mm -hmm. No, I I I think it's cooler if they are treating these as archival footage, right? So Elon Musk is talking in the present tense in his footage, but it's introduced as in 2016. Mm -hmm. Elon oh, Musk. Oh, that's predicted. great. Or 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 even in the near future, like go ahead and peg it as 2018, sure. 2019, 2022. But have them all because we know them as people alive today. Like these are all eight year olds. All the astronauts are currently eight years old in our reality. Right. right. Um. And then and then maybe in a George Lucas style crossover, you could have an eight year old go up to and interrupt his interview, saying like, "One day I'm gonna be the <laughs> guy that goes to Mars." <laughs> <laughs> and there she is piloting <laughs> yeah sorry it's yeah, uh, a terrible whoopee. idea <laughs> uh trailer is out for netflix sci-fi movie arc a r q it is about a man who gets shot and wakes up remembering the future and then he has to go through it all again uh you can call it edge of tomorrow you can call it groundhog day but it's coming september 16th love it love that idea loved it when kurt vonnegut wrote about it in time quake is great sure yeah and and the idea is that the arc is something that this guy has and the people who shoot him are trying to take it and it is causing the time loop. So it's integral to the plot. Cool. I like uh, that. I like anything that has to do with with time travel or uh, you know any any kind of concept where because what do we want most in life when you think about human beings what are you thinking about when you're falling asleep is yeah, I wish I could have done that different or I should have done this. And, you know, any show that kind of lets you explore the potentiality of what if I could do it different or the next time that I wake up, it, it might be a little bit different. And, Dude, you know, uh, that's that is the seductive property that kept me on the road for 15, 20 years is when you're on stage doing a variety magic show, you are living Groundhog Day. You you have a heckler shout something and you handle it poorly. And then four days later, you snap your fingers. You're like, ah, that's what I should have said. And then you wait. And then seven years later, someone <laughs> says the exact thing. And you're like, ha ha. I mean, it's 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 uh, there's these moments you get really close to that seductive high of getting the perfect show. Yeah. Uh, HBO's Westworld halted production last fall, and there were a lot of rumors about why. Apparently, according to the Verge article, uh, they wanted the writers to lay out a, the least five seasons worth of episodes. Uh, Westworld premieres October 2nd on HBO. So the idea was they wanted to know from the beginning exactly where they were going. So they wanted to write the episodes ahead of time. This is my favorite reason to delay a thing. Yeah, it's really. like, is, is the moneyed interest saying... More ambition. We need more ambition. We're going to back this for a longer amount of time. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Justin Timberlake's concert film debuts on Netflix October 12th. Justin Timberlake and the Tennessee Kids uh, is the title uh, of the performance from the Las Vegas stop of the 2020 Experience Tour. Uh, it's an, another venturing out for Netflix. That, not that this is the first concert documentary, but they're doing more of these. Yeah, right on. Uh, a couple of renewals. Netflix confirmed Stranger Things season two for 2017. Are we excited? We're excited. Yeah, a little bit. 
Uh, especially yeah. uh, especially since the rumors are it, it directly just keeps on going, tells the same story. We're not looking at an anthology or anything. Oh, right. okay, I good. love that. This, I mean, everyone's talking about how great this show was. I think for people, uh, probably like all three of us, who were probably the about the age of the boys in the show when it was on, uh, you know, it's... They get everything right and they do it without glamorizing or making the uh, ma making it seem I know you guys have talked about it, but, you know, they, they do it in such a way that you don't feel like, oh, they're making fun of the 80s or they're making it seem like something it wasn't. They just nail it. And so taking us back to that world the way that it really felt. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for that. Well, and they also did it without the established licensed property, without being a remake, without being right. a cash grab or any of that stuff. They, they instead just spoke to, to our hearts. Right. And Netflix has confirmed a new Narcos season. Mm, uh, mm, so mm, mm. actually Dude. new Narcos seasons, it sounds like. Yeah. No, uh, very, very excited. It, uh, the the little teaser trailer just shows Pablo Escobar going out of focus and says the blow must go on, uh, which is really interesting. I haven't gotten to the end of uh, season two, but I'm pretty sure. Oh, I guess I guess. Yeah, no, there it is. We see another uh, we see another guy. Um uh yeah, dude, uh, loving narcos, but I'm pretty I'm pretty sure Pablo Escobar dies at the end. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I, 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 don't, oh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that. I, I'm I'm just that's my uh, vibe. In development, Netflix has ordered White Rabbit Project from former MythBusters Carrie Byron, Byron, Grant Imahara, and Tony Bellici, who will investigate strange topics using science to find out whether they're really strange or not. Uh, which is what they do really well, and uh, that's coming December 9th. Congrats to those guys, because they've all done independent projects, and it's all been echoes of what we loved about them in Mythbusters, but uh, yeah, the three of them together, I, I know they've done some other thing about, like, roller coasters or whatever. Uh, hopefully this will be, you know, more exactly what we loved about them in Mythbusters. Hulu has a 13-episode comedy series in development called Future Man, starring Josh Hutcherson. Uh, if you watched Hunger Games, he's PETA in Hunger Games. Uh, Hutcherson plays a janitor-slash-dejected gamer recruited by mysterious visitors to save humanity. Uh, Seth Rogen's one of the EPs, as is Evan Goldberg, coming in 2017. This one makes me nervous. I don't yeah, know why. A, this is a pass for me. Yeah. Why is yeah. that? With Seth Rogen on board? Uh, you know, like I'm not a huge Seth Rogen fan. I don't like the name Future Man, even if it's supposed to be funny. I, I still don't like it. I just I don't find comedy shows as funny as other people. Uh, let, so let me let me, let me tell you, action know. action comedy is a tricky business on yeah. television. Speci I would have agreed with you 100. percent I would have had no interest in hearing the words produced by uh, Seth Rogen until I saw Preacher. Preacher made me a believer in the Seth Rogen as producer brand, and if and if he can if this is half as good as Preacher, then it's great. Netflix will launch a talk show called Bill Nye Saves the World next year. It'll be their second talk show after Chelsea Handler. Each episode will tackle a topic from a scientific point of view, dispelling myths and refuting anti-scientific claims. So the second myth-busting type show from Netflix. Uh, tonight's show's Mike Drucker will be the head writer, and Phil Plate is the head science writer. Uh, right on. Phil Plate's a friend. Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad about that. And uh, it, it's interesting to see Netflix going to more talk-style shows when they don't have the the appointment viewing reputation. Oh, I can't contain it. There's going to be so much smug self-righteousness. I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dan, is, it, is, is that going to sway you at all? No, I mean I like I like all of that. I, I'm I'm in I'm in on that one. Yeah, uh, hopefully Smugness they'll have uh, Neil I'm, deGrasse fine. Tyson on as a guest, Brian. Okay, yeah, stop, just stop, <laughs> stop, stop, <laughs> stop. They're all good all right. people. They're all doing really good things. That good science is good. Uh, you're being you're being good, Brian. You're being good. <laughs> Let's move on to under surveillance uh, and ask our guest, Dan Benjamin. What have you been watching? So the, in, in these detailed show notes, I know that you don't often break the fourth wall like this on, on, on this show, but the, you, you, the, your listeners and viewers should see the show notes that you guys – I'm. can you believe this show? I'm talking to my producer. You, uh, why don't we have show notes like that? <laughs> this is uh, – uh, we're causing uh, producer envy. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's nuts. Just I, I, I was joking, but skirt. I'm not really joking. Before the show, like I'll, I'll have, I'll have like, a, like a, a receipt – 
from a store that'll have like 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 the word like uh, cars written on it, and that's <laughs> supposed to clue me in for what I'm supposed to talk about for 90 minutes. You guys have everything broken down. It's I'm I'm in awe of it. I lo I love it. I've never seen anything like it before. Uh, and so next to your little where you have the names of the shows written down, you have something in parentheses that'll have like a number 209, 210. Are these episode numbers? Yeah, I don't think yeah. there have been. 210 oh, man. episodes. Oh, uh, Somebody has not pirated nearly enough stuff on BitTorrents. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I, I Otherwise, I, I, you would I, recognize that 209, so 209 means season means two. season two, episode nine. <laughs> yeah. So why don't you write S-O-2-E-09 okay, like a well, human? Again, if you pirated enough, you know that there are both of them <laughs> as far as nomenclatures go. All right. Well, you know, I've, I've been schooled, so thank you for that. <laughs> I don't have the numbers, and I put in there, I don't know what 201 to 204 means, but... <laughs> Obviously, like I saw you guys had both put a Mr. Robot on there. I'm like, well, I can't put Mr. Robot on there. But then I, I thought about it. I'm like, well, I have to put Mr. Robot on there because if I don't, it'll I'd be like, I don't watch it. I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed with Mr. Robot. And you're caught up, right? I'm, well, I'm caught up. So you watched episode 210 this week. If, uh, you mean S O two E one zero? Yes, I did. This I did is why. <laughs> I have seen that one, uh, and and I loved it. I, I'm enjoying it. People were complaining that the season was slow going. I I love it. I love a good character study. I love the twist. I, I loved everything about Mr. Robot. I'm enjoying it. Uh, and and as somebody who did uh, Unix and Linux system administration for decades seeing their accuracy, seeing how everything that they do is is seems far-fetched and is yet completely realistic. I, I, I love it. Acting is great. Framing is cinematography is beautiful. What, what more can you say? What can you say? No, it's a, it's a, an amazing show. And, and I was a little worried if they could pull it off season two, especially with Sam Esmail writing all of the episodes, right. which could go either way. Uh, but he, I feel he definitely like directed this... all of them, but I think one of the last two I've specifically yeah, he, noticed that is written by a pair of other people. He directed them all. They were yeah. not oh, all Oh, he directed written. them all. Right, Sorry, right, my, right, my right. mistake. Yeah. Uh, but even so, uh, it has, in my opinion, mostly gotten better throughout the season. Yeah. And I, so I also put on there, uh, Netflix has, has something called Chef's Table. Have you guys talked about that, seen that before? We've mentioned it a couple of times, but refresh people's memory. Netflix. Okay, so if you've ever seen uh, the wonderful, wonderful documentary called uh, "Jiro Dreams of Sushi," which sure, is about sure. a master sushi chef in uh, Japan, and his restaurant is like it's known worldwide as being like the most amazing sushi restaurant, and it's basically just him and uh, the guys that that help him, and it's in like a subway station, and yet it's you know he 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 makes what he wants to make, and it's a, a wonderful story of how hard it is to just get a get to eat there and his whole but if you enjoy a, a documentary or a show like that about the food about the chef uh chef's table is wonderful because each episode is a spotlight on a different chef usually making a different kind of cuisine and often in a different part of the world not just us but all around the world and it's great because you get to understand what and all of the chefs that are featured are um, there's like a rating system for best restaurants in the world. All of them rank very highly in this. So you get to hear their stories and all of them are typically their stories of struggle of how the chef, uh, learned what they were doing and fought against, uh, great opposition to start their own restaurant and cook the kind of food they dreamt of cooking. And it, it, the food is shot so gorgeously and, um, the, the stories are very personal and it's, it's a wonderful way to spend, you know, 42 minutes, uh, highly recommend it. And uh, the last one is a show that I'm watching because Twitter told me to watch it. I asked uh, Twitter for uh, what what would be a show that I should watch. I'm looking for a new show to watch. And I tabulated, I let them make suggestions and tabulated all of them. And surprisingly, The Good Wife, uh, which is a show I'd never seen before, uh, came up uh, on top. And I said, all right, and let's, let's give this a try. And I've been really, really enjoying it also. I'm into the uh, two, or what I would say – S2 season of it. Uh, and it's it's very good. And I'm really enjoying that too. There's enough episodes, I think that, you know, because it was on TV, CBS, you can get it on Hulu. And it is, um, uh, it, it, there, there's, they have, you know, whatever, 20 some episodes per season. And I think it was five or six seasons. So there's hundreds of episodes out there. And it's really great for binging. And you don't have to worry, are you getting close to the end? So highly recommend that. Yeah, I've heard some really, really good things from from a lot of different types of people uh, about that show, and I, it makes sense that that is the other thing besides Star Trek 
that they're going to bring to CBS All Access. It's obviously right. not continuation, but a spinoff uh, right. from that. Uh, Brian, obviously, Mr. Robot Justified, and uh, you mentioned Narcos as Most well. Most of season two of Narcos, man, it's great. I'm, I, uh, it's great because I know you're not watching it. I know Bonnie's not watching it, and I know that if only ha- if I'm only half paying attention, ain't nobody gonna judge me because I'm watching it for me and I'm having a great time. <laughs> it's a relief, isn't it? Yeah. It really is. I, I felt it's that awesome. way about Angie Tribeca too. Right on. Uh, not nearly as deep of a show, though. Uh, the only thing I've been watching besides Mr. Robot uh, for, and Justified is the things on the plane ride. Uh, when I returned uh, this weekend, I watched X-Men Apocalypse. This is my review of X-Men Apocalypse. I needed a movie that wasn't so bad that I'd want to stop watching it, but wasn't so good that if I drifted off to sleep, I would feel bad that I was missing something. And X-Men Apocalypse was the perfect movie for that. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, a glowing quote, review right there Mr. on the poster. Yeah. The perfect movie. <laughs> Tom Merritt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dot, dot, dot. Did you guys talk uh, about The Night, watched, the night uh, Of yet? Have you talked about that? No, I, I don't know. I think we recommended about it, it a yeah, few yeah. weeks ago, but it's fantastic. It just oh, fantastic. Up. Absolutely yeah. great. Perfect. Uh, perfect show. And the other, uh, which show was that you mentioned just now? The Night Of on HBO. Oh, yeah, no, I've heard that's great. Um, like I, if you haven't seen it, like really it's, it's only, there's only eight episodes and it's superb. It's superb. I'm seeing Bryce nod over here. All right. Uh, the other, the other thing I watched once I was awake on the plane was Hitchcock, which I hadn't gotten around to. That movie is fantastic. Uh, I thought Anthony Hopkins, yeah, I forgot he was Anthony Hopkins. They became Hitchcock. It was really well done. Uh, and if you love Hitchcock movies, there's so many little homages, even just in the way they do some shooting. Uh, it's fantastic. What have you been on the lookout for, Bryce? For a second there, I thought you were talking about Hitch, the Will Smith vehicle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ah, they just did the cin- cinematic homages in Hitch. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, well, da- uh, first off, before we get to the pick, Dan reminded me that uh, there's a new season of Chef's Table, Chef's Table France. Right, all French restaurants. That's I think that's available now on Netflix. Check that out. This uh, this look on the lookout uh, was sent in by Tim. He writes, "I have a suggestion for you that might be quite a bit different than what you might normally go for. It's a YouTube series called Expedition Overland. It's about a group of guys that get in their trucks and drive just all over the place. Season one, they go from Montana to Alaska and Canada." Uh, he says it's the closest thing to reality TV that I can possibly watch. Plus, the scenery is beautiful, uh, and he sent us the link, which we'll have in the show notes. I uh, I checked out the first few episodes on YouTube, and Tim really nailed it. This looks like uh, any of those survival reality shows that you would probably watch on like the History Channel or A&E. Uh, but what's different is that the personalities that you've got in here are not... Um, th- there's like a levity to it. They are very human and they're, they are having a good time and it's not always dire situations out on the, on the sea crabbing boats. Um, but, it, but it's also really fantastic. And they talk about a lot of the gear that they use on their trucks as well as uh, camera and production equipment because, you know, the, the cinematographer is, is along for the ride for them. Uh, right now, there are three full series of Expedition Overland available on YouTube. Uh, this uh, Alaska Yukon one, one in Central America, and then one of like older ones that they've done in the past. I think it's a, like a series of shorter ones. If you just search Expedition Overland, uh, go to their channel and they've got them as playlists on YouTube. Oh, excellent uh, choice. Thanks for sending that in, Tim. And if you've got something we should be on the lookout for, email us cordkillers at gmail.com. Before we get to front lines, though, Brian, uh, you've got some news about the Modern Rogue channel out here. Yep, it's over. Uh, the Modern what? Rogue, everyone loves it. Uh, basically, people keep asking for more of what we're doing on Hacking the System. Jason and I having crazy exploits. It's better than Hacking the System, in my opinion, and it will never be on the Scam School channel again. What? Why What? Why are you getting rid of it? It's, because but it's, so popular it's got and wonderful. its own channel now! What? <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is something that we knew was in the works from the very beginning. We spent nine months incubating this thing, and it's a really good show. If you haven't watched The Modern Rogue, I'm really, really proud of it. Uh, you can see all the episodes. Just go to bit.ly slash modern rogue channel and get this. Right now, like like I only, we only launched it like 48 hours ago. There's only 217 subscribers. I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to bust through 100,000. I'm, I'm hoping 
you know, I should never say this in public, but I would love it if we hit 100,000 in two, two or three months and we hit a million within a year or two. Um, uh, I think that Modern Rogue has the potential to be even more popular than Scam School because it's something, it's all really, really easily approachable stuff. If you liked hacking the system, do me a favor, subscribe right now to The Modern Rogue. In fact, to promote it, I'm going to do an AMA on Reddit this Friday. Oh, and uh, don't forget, folks, you can get those low subscriber bragging rights if you subscribe right now. In fact, once, you know, once just, it gets up towards a million, you could tell subscribers, oh, I'm subscriber 235. Be you know, one of the first you know, yeah. 1,000. Be one of the first 1,000 right now. Head on over. All right, let's move on to the front lines. Front lines. Bloomberg sources tell it that Amazon is looking into buying the rights to live sporting events, uh, stuff like tennis Rugby, golf, soccer, auto racing are among the sports named in the article. Uh, they might also look to add sporting networks as add-ons. So like the Major League Baseball Channel, uh, NFL Network types of things. Amazon hired a former Sports Illustrated exec James DeLorenzo and former YouTube exec Charlie Neiman to build partnerships with sports companies. That is a fact. And Bloomberg sources are saying they're, they're looking at doing live streaming sports as part of your Amazon Prime package. Right on. Time Incorporated will launch its first streaming network Tuesday called People Entertainment Weekly Network, or PEN. I cannot confirm or deny that they're taking that from my daughter's name. The free ad-supported network will launch on Roku, Amazon, Fire TV, Apple TV, and Chromecast with 50 hours of existing programming and 15 original series coming in the, in the next year. That is a huge opening bid. That's, that's big. Yeah, and they're taking some things that time has produced in the past to kind of fill out the schedule. But this, in light of our earlier conversation about ad free, Dan, uh, I think it's interesting that yeah. here's time going out on a limb and saying, we're just going to go free, but with ads. Yeah, I love it. I mean, I think, and again, the more we see this, uh, the, the better anything that changes. The old guard is good. Anything that uh, turns things upside down is good. Whether you have ads or not, I don't think that matters. But change the way you've been doing it. Do something different. Uh, try something else because most of what we have isn't working anymore. Yep. If you've ever heard about time series Life in Space uh, that was on, uh, I can't remember what network it was on, but it was on regular TV, that will be on this channel as well. Sony announced new PlayStation models last week. Uh, the new PS Pro will be able to play 4K videos from Netflix, and all PS4 models will get an update to allow HDR videos from the services. Yeah. After September 30th, Sony Bravia TVs from before 2012 will no longer be able to play YouTube. According to Sony, YouTube is exceeding the capability of the older hardware, likely a reference to encrypted connections. Told you, Tom, they rolled the tape back. Brian, four years ago, what did he say he wanted his televisions to be? D-U-M. Totally dumb. contained with no removable parts. Dumb, 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 dumb. That's what he wanted him to be. And instead, you get this smart television. Ain't so smart now, are you, Bravia users? Yeah. Uh, Sling TV added the Pac-12 network to its sports package and Stars, uh, which is a $9 a month add-on. Sling TV also launched a Windows 10 app. They had a Windows app before, but this one is optimized for the new Windows 10 operating system. And finally, the latest Fire TV update integrates search across 75 apps. Roku claims 25 and Apple says 30. So the race for cross-app search continues. Uh, love it. Love it. More cross app, everything, the better. Let's see some dispatches because I hear they're from the front. Hmm. Yeah, this one smells like death. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> it must be from the front. Do we need to read that one then? Yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, our first one comes from Byron, who was saying that uh, he lives in the NBC Sports app, and he thought the Olympic uh, app, as it was, delivered everything that we were asking for. He set notifications for events he wanted, and he would see those notifications when an important event was about to start, and he'd click on it and live stream and watch. I, I had that same app, and I had that same experience. I think I just wanted to make fewer decisions about having to set it up, but but if it worked for you, excellent. Uh, he said one complaint is that most of the events tended to be a raw feed, if it made the primetime broadcast, that would be when you'd get the actual commentary. Aside from the Olympic stuff, though, Byron points out he wanted to offer a tip for Premier League soccer fans. All games are broadcast on TV, but depending on the cable company, some games are in standard def. In the app, all games are high def. There's also a Red Zone-like app-only channel called Goal Rush. This shows the game of the day live and cuts to big plays and goals in all of the games. Definitely great if you have a fantasy team. 
That's such a brilliant idea. Uh, our favorite industry insider, Derek, writes, Hey, Tom and Brian, wanted to throw a quick comment, non-advertising related, regarding your discussion on The Departed. The movie, despite often being as uh, quoted as an original or a, quote, masterpiece, is not original. And the movie itself is a remake of the 2002 award-winning film Internal Affairs from Hong Kong. The true original has a prequel and a sequel as well, of which portions were incorporated into the American remake. I don't believe it's on Netflix though it's available for rent and purchase on amazon good catch derek infernal affairs i bet that was on my flight on demand i wish i would have known that oh it does uh, i'm sorry Zach... i said internal affairs it is infernal affairs sorry about that even oh, yeah, google no fixed it wow when i searched wow <laughs> uh zach uh, wrote in and said what would be the best way to watch the cw without cable i've used the xbox app but it's not that great and the app has ads would you recommend buying an HD antenna or buying season passes for the DC shows on Amazon? If antenna is the better route, what brand would you recommend? Uh, yeah, I mean, the CW app is going to be the most reliable way for the past five episodes, but won't have them all. So if you wanted to get a DVR, uh, like a channel master, and hook it up to an HD antenna, that probably is the best way if you get good reception. Uh, but the bulletproof way where you don't have to buy an antenna and try it out, uh, I like the Mohu but honestly, I would recommend going to Wirecutter and just searching because they have a great article on antennas there right now. Uh, I think buying the shows is probably your safest route. That's and then you have to deal with commercials. I'm so glad that you said that. It's like once you once you get a taste of it's like it's worth 20 bucks. Every time there's a show you love and you know you're going to love it, just spend the 20 to $30 and you will not regret it. Right, Dan? I totally agree with you. And the only thing that's sometimes frustrating, and I, I'm seeing this less and less these days, but – Sometimes, my opinion, if I buy a show on iTunes then uh, and, and it comes out on Monday night, I should get that email. I'm not checking for it at 2 a.m., but at 2 a.m., I should get that email that says your show is ready to go, and then I should be able to watch it uh, the next night. Sometimes there's a delay in there. Sometimes Small. there's a lag time that seems in inexplicable. Days go by. As This was bad with American Horror Story especially. But uh, it, other than that one thing and that it's not always as reliable as you'd like it to be or as it would be if you watched it live or were able to record it yourself, That's I just want to mention that because I know your listeners would be upset if I didn't warn them. Sure, sure, sure. A small price to pay as far as I'm concerned. Totally. Uh, Joel says, hey, guys, you keep saying that Netflix has the new Star Trek Discovery show for everywhere but the U.S. Well, you forgot about Canada. Bell Media outbid Netflix, will air the premiere on CTV, then the rest on the Space Channel, where, which you need cable for. They say it may, may be available for later for streaming. Uh, Space also got the entire Star Trek back catalog that will just air on cable, not streaming. Man, Bell sucks. Mounties have been dispatched, Joel. They'll be taking you for a polite talking to for, forthwith. Until you say you're sorry. Sure, sure. Uh, finally, uh, Brian says, hey, Brian and Tom, I spell my Brian with a Y. Why do you spell yours with an I, Brian? <laughs> he actually didn't write that. Uh, but he did say, on your recent discussion of how to retain your in-country Netflix experience while traveling, my solution has been to use a VPN tied to my home router. So he runs the Tomato Router software on his Asus router because he's a geek. And he's wondering if the router vendors are going to start including that kind of software in their crackdown as well. He's had no issues traveling to Europe or South America and keeping the home version of Netflix. Netflix, Netflix, Netflix. <laughs> uh, granted, roll your own VPN is probably more complicated than most are interested messing with, but the router vendors might have an opportunity to differentiate their product for the globe trotting public. I can't imagine there's any way to crack down on this, right? Because it's the same IP that you've been watching from all that <laughs> other stuff. They have no way of knowing whether it's being routed somewhere else. That would else have to be pretty them. specific to start cracking down on tomato routers. <laughs> uh, and, and it's not a large number of people anyway. They, all the, the only reason they're cracking down on VPN all, at all is to impress their production, their programming partners. And, and cracking down on the tomato router is not going to increase the impression. Correct, so. correct. Dan Benjamin, where can we see more of your lovely beard? Ah, uh, you can go. Well, I'm on Twitter at Dan Benjamin. You can go to five by five TV to uh, check out any of the uh, shows that I do. They're all pretty much there. I don't do all the ones that you're scrolling past there, but I do a few of them. And uh, I would love it if you guys would go there to to check it out. When and can I, I also when can I come visit the studio uh, and and hang out again? I want to be on another show. Well, whenever you want, you just you know where I am. Mm. I'm here every day. Yeah, but I want you to want me. I want you to I've, call oh, It's never stopped. It's <laughs> never once stopped. <laughs> All right. All right. Done. 5by5.tv. That's the number 5, B-Y, 5, if you don't already know, dot T. 
TV. Go check it out. Our website is cordkillers.com. Our email address is cordkillers at gmail.com. We're live on diamondclub.tv Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Netflix. We'll see you then. Hey, guys. Tom and Brian here. We just wanted to say thank you to all of our $5 patrons who keep us loud, live, and independent. You guys make Cord Killers the production that it is. Your name appears in the video credits and appears in our hearts. And if you'd like to become one of them or see who they are, you can go to patreon.com slash cord killers. You'll need to do more than just go there, though. You'll have to sign up and, you know, pledge an amount. But Unless you just want to see who they are. Well, I mean, you can gawk. That's a little creepy, isn't it? If you want to be a gawker, let's go. Up to you. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>